Welcome. This is the Life Habits Podcast Series, and my name is Carl Vradenberg. This is the series that helps you to learn new habits to optimize your life in order to stay sane in this crazy world. This is episode number 18, and the topic for today is self-actualization. Let's start, as we usually do, with some quotes from famous people. Let's start off with one from Bill Gates. He says, The world won't care about your self-esteem. The world will expect you to accomplish something before you feel good about yourself. Steve Jobs says, Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice, heart, and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. Norman Vincent Peale says, One of the greatest moments in anybody's developing experience is when he no longer tries to hide from himself, but determines to get acquainted with himself as he really is. Og Mandino says, take the attitude of a student, never too big to ask questions, never know too much to learn something new. And finally, an unknown author says, seeing yourself as you want to be is the key to personal growth. So this topic of self-actualization comes from an American psychologist from many years ago named Abraham Maslow, and he developed a system and overall theory that was called the hierarchy of needs. And this is an approach that, while having been around for a long time, has had lots of additional research done to it over the years, but fundamentally is still a very, very important theory for the approach to all aspects of your life. And it's been one that has been a personal favorite of mine. It comes up in conversations on a very regular basis when I deal with people at work when I deal with uh, people in other uh, aspects of my life as well. And it's really a fundamental one to the ways in which we can think about the way we approach day-to-day existence. And so let's talk a little bit about what this overall approach is all about. The basic idea of this is that there's a hierarchy, and it's usually depicted as a triangle or a pyramid with uh, the the bars uh, going horizontally of the the topics that I'm going to be talking about here. So he talks about that there really are a set of needs that are considered to be deficit needs, meaning you have to have these in order to have any decent existence and also uh, in order to actually get to a higher level of being as well, which we'll get into in a minute. But he talks about the notion of these deficit needs, including things like physiological needs. And that's basically you need food and water. And the idea here is that if you don't have that, you can't have these uh, other needs as well. You can't be exploring all kinds of higher level thinking, uh, trying to become an absolute better person if uh, every day you spent your time trying to satisfy the most basic needs of these physiological needs. The second one is safety needs. So this is if you're in grave danger all the time, you have to be constantly looking out for your back. This is an area, again, where uh, you need to satisfy these in order to get to the next level. Same thing with belonging needs, and this is in order to really have good relationships and be validated by other people, etc. And then esteem needs, the whole notion of getting some recognition, some level of feedback on the work that you do, whatever that may be. So he talks about these being the deficit needs that you have to have in order to get to the being needs. And that is the needs that really are all all about trying to become the person that you want to be. And he talks about this as being the whole area of self-actualization. So this whole area of self-actualization, the way that he went about developing this was going and looking at the lives of very famous, very successfully famous people that have really achieved significant innovation, significant creativity, and have contributed a lot to the world. So you looked at a whole list of people, but people like Abraham Lincoln, Albert Einstein, Albert Schweitzer, William James, you know, some of the really, uh, uh, some real movers and shakers from the time that he uh, was looking at this topic. And what he really looked at was what kinds of characteristics did these people have that really set them apart? What were the kind of elements that led to their self-actualization? They're really getting to a higher level of being where they could contribute at a higher level and get satisfaction too at that level that they're really truly in touch with themselves 
are truly in touch with what they truly want to achieve, and very importantly, achieving it because they have this self-actualized approach to life. So as I've normally done, come up with 10 ideas for us to explore of things that you can work on developing as skills, and then when they become really routine skills, then they can become habits. And then when you have them as habits, you do them without really thinking about them. And then they establish themselves as a way of doing the work that you do day to day and the approach to these topics on a regular basis as well. So let's go through these 10 items. The first item is solitude. You want to basically get away from everyone and everything, including technology. You want to, on a regular basis, get in touch with yourself. This is one of these areas where we have so many things in our lives normally on a day-to-day -day basis that it's very difficult for many people to really get into any of this self-actualized sort of state because they're just too busy. There's too much impinging on them on a regular basis every single day, whether it's, you know, kids, whether it's people at, uh, at work, whether it's your cell phone, whether it's your iPod, they all take attention away from you. They're the ones that uh, uh, pull your attention and you're not really in control of your attention while you're doing that. Now, while I've mentioned many, many times, there are situations where that is quite appropriate and where you really want to be doing that. But there are also times, and that's what this number one solitude is all about, that no matter how busy you are, you really should make yourself completely get out of the situation entirely on a regular basis. Now, ideally, you do that once a day where you just find a time for yourself completely away from others and can be as, as short or as long as you want. But you basically need to get away from others, get away from your cell phone, get away from all interruptions and just be by yourself. Now, what do you do while you're by yourself? Well, a number of the other things that I'm going to be talking about are really what uh, you want to be doing in that state, but it's largely a state of not doing. I'll also remind you, but we really want to make sure that we're getting away from everything, everything else and having some time to yourself in a solitude state. Number two is relaxation. You want to really relax. You want to do some breathing, some meditation, and there's a, a number of places you can get a lot more information on various techniques for doing this. And I won't go into those here, but there are podcasts that you can subscribe to on meditation, for example, and progressive muscle relaxation. There's a variety of techniques that you can do. You can really get into and really can help you get into this state. But basically, you need to get into a relaxed state. Many people, when they do find some time of solitude and try to relax, realize that they don't really know how and that they're still really tense and their brain is still really racing and they really aren't in a state where true relaxation happens. That's often the case too. And they might want to fall asleep at night. They still have racing thoughts going through them on a regular basis. And what you want to do in this uh, state is to get out of that. You want to get out of that habit of constantly still having your mind going at a mile a minute. So what you want to do here is get into this relaxed state. And again, if you use, uh, and you can go into more fancy methods, but one of the best ways to do this is similar to the approach that I talked about last time to get into a regular breathing pattern. And one of the ways that you can do that is to take a nice deep breath in, hold it in and try to breathe from your diaphragm and not up into your chest. Okay, so you want to take a really deep uh, breath, hold it there, and then slowly blow it out and actually concentrate on your out breath as well until it's completely out. And when, it, when you think that you've completely expelled all your air, blow even some more. So get all the air out of your lungs and take another deep breath. If you keep that up, you'll be focusing on your breath. You'll also be as we talked about last time, getting your whole system into a parasympathetic state, meaning that your heart rate will slow, your overall system will relax, and you'll get into this special state of relaxation. You can also use some uh, meditation techniques, and there's a number of these that you can uh, 
you can employ uh, that, again, you can get uh, ideas elsewhere. But the, the basic idea here as well is to focus the mind. So you want to get into a physical state, into a, a comfortable, you know, sitting position. Sitting on the floor cross-legged is a very good one to get you into this state. And then really, when you've relaxed your mind with the breathing technique I just talked about, now you want to concentrate on a single thing. You want to choose a word, choose an image that gets you really uh, relaxed. And for me, for example, it's the warmth of the sun on my eyes if you're lying in the on on sand and at the at the beach you know that kind of a, an image get get the, an, an image into your mind that really is the most uh, relaxing to you and keep that in mind if you do that you're effectively forcing your body with your mind to get into a, a, an extremely relaxed state and you'll notice that after a while if you do this on a regular basis you'll be able to get into this state really quickly and it the actual times of solitude where you do this kind of work will end up uh, not taking very much time you can uh, fit it in anywhere into your day i think it's a really really effective way of doing this now in addition to getting into that state and then doing everything just to relax yourself this is also the time when you're nice and relaxed to start to now think about some personal reflection it's the time if you do it once in the day it's the time to reflect on your dreams your goals and the progress that you're making toward those as well. Given that you're already into a calm state, you want to now be thinking about, for example, your dreams, visualizing again what it is that you wanted to achieve. We spent many episodes in this series talking about the whole notion of keeping focus on things that are the most important to you in your life. This is the time to now bring those images to your mind as well. Visualize the uh, realization, not the want of the dream, but the realization. The Tell yourself that you've actually achieved whatever it is that you had as your dream and the satisfaction of the goals that you had as well. Now, these might be the visualization of you being successful at whatever it is that you were wanting to be successful at. It can also be the visualization of the goals that you've achieved, let's say, that are the sub-goals, as we've talked about before as well. Not necessarily this end of the cycle sort of goal. You want to actually visualize your sub-goal. Maybe it's the goal that you want to achieve that week and having achieved it as well. In addition to that kind of visualization, you want to also be thinking of you know, how you're doing in terms of the progress toward those goals. And you want to also step back and say, I think to yourself, what can I do to more effectively achieve even the sub goals that I just, just, uh, I'm trying to achieve. And you want to also step back. And this is number four to feel some satisfaction with yourself for having achieved the goals. So you're, you're visualizing, you know, the, you having achieved the goals in that state in the, in the future, as I talked about, but you also want to, as I was saying, Think about what you have achieved, what in the past you've already achieved that is getting you toward the goal, whether it's a satisfaction of having completed a sub-goal uh, or maybe several sub-goals. You want to really step back and feel satisfied and really get give yourself some, some positive reinforcement for having achieved those uh, sub-goals as well. Number five is feel and express some gratitude. This is to yourself and also think hard about expressing some gratitude to others in your life as well. So this is after you've had your period of solitude and you've thought about who really has contributed to the life that you have right now and the ways in which you're actually going about the work you're doing. You want to think about the, those people that are really making a difference and tell them so. Many, many people just never think to say thank you or to just say to somebody, let's say, that really just did, made you really feel good or just really helped you in, in achieving a particular sub goal that you had for yourself. A lot of the time we just, you know, say, oh, thanks. But it's actually n not as heartfelt if you say it that way as if you were to come up to them and say, look, I, I really wanted to just take this moment to point out to you how much that meant to me, what you did and the way that you helped me there. I know you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to go to the extents that, uh, that you did. I just want you to know that I really, really appreciate it, and I'd like to really thank you. 
And you might even want to go to, you know, just buy them a coffee or whatever, or whatever as well. But it, it, it's the idea that really counts here to feel and express gratitude. And then the other thing you want to do on a regular basis, and this is again a, a characteristic that these people that uh, Abraham Maslow talked about with regard to self-actualization, what they also were really good at compared to a lot of other people at the time was this notion of visualization of the future state. You want to make sure that you can develop the skill to imagine with all kinds of detail what a future state might look like. I know people that just say, well, I can't, I can't think that way. I, I have no, no way of uh, sort of seeing what the future is going to be like, and I, I'm just not able to do this visualization thing. This is something to develop as a skill into a habit. This is truly critically important to visualize the future. And this is not a notion, as we've talked about before, of just wishing a future. This is a visualizing, visualizing that you're actually achieving whatever future state you want, whatever that might be. You want to really be able to run a movie in your head of what that future state might be. The evidence suggests that if you're good at doing that, if you can actually visualize how all this might come together, whether it's a, an approach to a new way of doing things at work, and it doesn't matter what kind of thing that might be, if you can visualize how all of that would work together and you're in some position to be able to make that happen, visualizing at first will make a huge difference in actually being able to execute and deliver on the elements that will make that a reality. Some of the most famous people even today are people that are able to really try to not just systematize or or have elements to, that need to be put together to achieve some future state. They really have this, this, this ability to uh, visualize or play the movie in their head of what that future state might be. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of whether it's in your period of solitude where you do that, or just you know while you're doing other activities during the day, or while you're also thinking about how things might be in the future. And, th and this can be things at work, or it can even be things with regard to your home situation. It might be you know some things that you want to achieve in, in a, an athletic uh, way. If it's a matter of trying to get particularly better at, let's say it's running, and you you visualize yourself successfully doing the Boston Marathon. That might be an example of one. Actually, I just I should mention too that, you know, in sports is an interesting area with regard to this whole notion of visualization. It turns out that uh, years ago, the Russian, uh, it was the Soviet Union at the time, hockey team used to practice their uh, hockey skills as a team by all of them sitting together in the change room with their eyes closed and going through the play in their heads. And they would indicate to each other when you know, they were passing the puck from one to the other uh, and when the other one received it, etc. And they got to, as a team, actually visualize how the whole play would, would uh, take place. And as you might know, uh, this is a team that was really, really successful. And at the time, you know, North American hockey... Uh, was really more a matter of, of always just going out there and doing it, you know, having a play, and, and it goes for any sport, and going out there and, and uh, executing it. And the whole idea was that it was just a matter of, of physically practicing it and that that's what you really needed to do. Well, where all the, the Russians at the time really were into this visualization, and they were in an interesting pers perspective because they now had in their heads the entire process the entire step-to-step -step of achieving, you know, the goal that they had. And if they could think it through, and if they could visualize it, then they could execute it as well. Of course, you have to have the skill to be able to execute as well. This isn't just a, a magical way of achieving these kinds of things without actually doing the hard work, hard work. But this is, again, in this category of self-actualization, right? The self-actualization, in this case, assumes that you already have those other basic needs met, and you've also got the basic skills developed, this is an approach to take you to the higher level to get to the self self-actualized state and the self-actualized state 
in the case of sports is to be able to do these things in your head so then you can actually execute on them as well in real life. Number seven is independence and being autonomous. And this is this notion, again, as a characteristic of these people that are good at self-actualization, to not always just depend on other people. And this is an idea that's beyond the notion of solitude. This is even when, when you're with others, is to really feel comfortable about your own experience, being your own person when it comes to suggestions that you have, for example, for improvement. Even if there's some, you know, reaction to it from others that say, I don't know, we, we've, we've done this before and it didn't seem to work or whatever. This is this notion of really stepping away from the group, truly thinking what is your opinion or what your ideas are, and then pursuing them, pursuing them with real confidence. And so here, here's an area where you want to, again, not just be into groupthink. You know, it's another psychological phenomenon that a number of people when they work together on a regular basis, really have this uh, notion of everybody starting to think the same. And there are times when you want to be doing that. Maybe the example that I gave a a moment ago with regard to the hockey team. But there are other times when you really want to make sure that you can step away from the pack and say, you know, I've got this idea. I'm really convinced that it's a good way to do this particular thing. And I want to really stick with it. And I really want to have an autonomous, uh, independent approach to achieving this because I'm convinced that this is the right way to go. And I don't want to be influenced by a lot of other people to say that this isn't the right thing to do. It's really sticking to your guns. It's really being confident that you really are right in this case and just keep going at it. You got to choose the things that you're going to approach this way. But this is a very, very important ingredient as well. Number eight is humility and respect for others. This is this whole area of not being arrogant. And this is an interesting perspective given the last one that I just talked about in terms of independence and autonomous approaches. You can be independent and autonomous, but you can approach it with, you know, humility and respect for others. So you can, uh, like we've talked about in previous episodes, you can disagree with somebody by still giving them respect. You can still have an opinion that you are right without being arrogant, right? So the real ingredient here is that while you may well have an idea or an approach that you'd like to carry out, that you want to do it in a way that you still have humility, that you're not arrogant about it, that you just express your ideas, not that you're so great, uh, and also that you respect other people's positions on a number of things, but that you really want to make sure that you still listen to their ideas, for example, and you might be uh, of an approach where you say, well, that's really, really good. I really appreciate your thoughts in that area. Uh, I think you've really done a lot of thinking and you've really come up with some interesting ideas, but I think that uh, we won't necessarily go uh, with those for this particular project at this particular time, but I do really appreciate the work you've done. So it, rather than, you know, approaching the topic as uh, one of, no, 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 that, that, that won't work, you know, uh, and in fact, I think it's a stupid idea, and uh, I don't know how you even came up with it. I mean, that would be, you know, the absolute wrong way to approach it, and I've seen that kind of behavior uh, more than I would like to, actually. But uh, again, the people that are really good at this self-actualization, getting to this much, much higher level, are really good at humility and respect for others. Number nine is a freshness of appreciation. There's this notion of getting to a state where you can be highly creative and really thinking outside the box. And that takes a point of view of being completely open to other people's ideas. Some of the time we develop for ourselves sort of a theory of the world, a theory of the ways in which we think, you know, even a project at work might want to go, or the way that you want to have your kids act, for example, or the way that you'd like your life to go. And then there's other ideas that people will come up with. And uh, a lot of people are really kind of rigid with that. And they come to those ideas and immediately are, you know, negative about them. Or even if they're not negative, they they don't truly, truly try to think hard about the ways in which that 
would work. And this item, and again, this characteristic of some of the best people in terms of self-actualization, having achieved, you know, the skills that are, and the habits that are fundamental to self-actualization, really have this freshness of appreciation, this almost childlike interest in any or all ideas, and really thinking hard about how those ideas and those uh, thoughts might uh, really work out. And this is this notion too, similar to the take the attitude of a student, never to be too big to ask questions and never know too much to learn something new. I think this whole notion of one of being honest and open about any and all new ideas. There's a, um, a guy that was a, a good friend of mine uh, when we were teenagers who, who actually got cancer uh, at the time uh, and, and died very young. But I spent some significant time with him going around all kinds of treatments uh, at the time. And what was interesting was his perspective on life was an incredibly fresh one at the time after he learned that he had uh, cancer. And he had this this incredible awe about life. And he would approach every situation that he found himself in with a really, really open and fresh attitude. Uh, We used to play in a band together and a typical reaction would be we would be asked to play some some song and they always would say oh you know that song right and a lot of people would respond to that by saying oh yeah yeah and then try to you know see if they could they, they could play it and uh, no this guy's reaction instead was no I don't actually know that song or don't know it very well you know could you sing it for me other situations too he would he would come to with this really fresh almost childlike uh, perspective and learn so much from somebody. You know, we'd come come up to somebody and somebody would be uh, saying something that lots of time the, the natural reaction to it would be that, okay, yeah, fine, you know, this person just happened to express a, an opinion that others disagreed about. And my friend would at the time, and I've seen many other people over the years do this as well, and I've tried to uh, do it myself as a result, is to take a point of view of, of really trying to understand that other person's point of view, if, especially if it's diametrically opposite to yours. You know, you've got this notion of the way that things work. And it might be, for example, with your kids too, that might just say something and your immediate reaction is, well, no, of course not. But if you really step back and think about it and really try to understand why it is that they're suggesting this or what's behind this, or if somebody has some other ideas on some other topic, and they're really against the, what your own thoughts are, try to dig in and try to be really open-minded. Try to have this freshness of appreciation about a particular topic. And what you'll find is if you have that kind of a perspective on a number of areas of interest, you're going to end up being a lot more creative. You're gr- going to grow as a person immensely because now you're going to be open to a lot of these other ideas that uh, people uh, have that in our regular day-to-day sort of life with filters on and only really wanting to deal with topics in the ways in which they fit into our own sort of schemes, our own sort of systems, our own theories today, this, this kind of approach opens you up to all kinds of new ideas and you'll find yourself growing as a person immensely. And, and you can do this in the smallest of ways, too. Just coming across somebody that you're sitting with on a plane or, you know, sitting next to somebody at a, at a, at a soccer match. I mean, when you get talking to them and, and really have an honest interest in what they're all about and their life experience, you're going to learn a lot and you're going to get a much more broad perspective on life as well. And number 10 is the reset button. And I like to visualize this actually as a reset reset button on uh, like a computer, for example. You probably all know and uh, deal with computers on a regular basis and that over time, especially the Windows operating system, tends to clog up basically that uh, various things happen, various programs may not have, you know, canceled appropriately and some drivers might have uh, had problems and the like and that some of the time it's just really useful to just restart the computer so that everything can start afresh. I have that concept just to round this out from having started with number one being taking the times of solitude to really push that reset button for yourself on a on a routine basis. You want to hear not just keep on running along in your 
life day to day, week to week. You really want to step back, take this perspective on life and, and really try to do this reset button. You can do this on, on a daily basis. I think it's the best way to do it that way, but also do it on a weekly basis. And what I would like to suggest is that here we are, at least when we're recording this in the middle of the summer, a lot of people are going on vacations uh, around this time. And that some of these skills that uh, I've been talking about in this series take some, you know, work to really start to practice and get good at. There's one, and the topic that we're talking about today, I think is ideally suited to people that are able to go on vacation and take some time away from their regular routine. This is the time to try to develop this approach to self-actualization, including this reset button, and to do that on a regular basis and develop it while you're doing your vacation time, and then also be able to take that back into your uh, normal day-to-day -day life once you've developed it into a set of skills and potentially even into a set of habits as you get into your day-to-day uh, -day work. So that's the topic of self-actualization. Now I wanted to mention that uh, you know podcasting is all about two-way communication. You know some people think it's all just one way that it's somebody doing a show like this and that other people like you you know listening to it. One of the things about this uh, web 2 approach to a variety of technologies uh, like this is that they really can be two-way. And that's increasing with this podcast as well. And I wanted to, again, thank all of you who have written in and who have provided uh, feedback. And I'm, I'm looking forward to even doing that even more. I asked you in the previous uh, session whether uh, you wanted me to do more interviews with people. I did uh, one with Kat Catherine Britton, as you may recall, a couple of uh, episodes ago. And the uh, feedback really was split. About an equal number of people really wanted to hear more interviews like that one. And others uh, preferred the format with uh, me speaking by myself on the podcast. And so the overall approach we'll take to this to try to satisfy everyone is to uh, do a little of both. The primary focus will be having me do these sessions like I'm doing today, but uh, where there are situations where there's a particular topic and a particular person that really has a unique perspective and that I can bring them on the show, I will do that as well. But the primary approach will still be the format that we're using today. Now, I didn't get any feedback on whether it would be useful to you to include the top 10 list. So, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, we have these uh, sessions and many of you I know listen to these while you're on the uh, treadmill or you're you know driving to work or whatever. And as I mentioned before, it occurred to me that it might not be very useful to only provide this information, uh, these top 10 lists to you uh, only in auditory form, uh, essentially on the podcast itself but to also make it available to you in a way that you can, you know, write it down and have it available to you after the session as well. So what I've decided to do here is to include the top 10 list directly in the MP3 file that you download, whether you're in uh, iTunes or, or wherever. And uh, the way that it works is that if you're using a really recent iPhone or an iPod Touch, you can just tap on the screen when the podcast is playing and you'll see the top 10 list displayed right there on your screen. Now others can get it if you don't have that kind of uh, iPhone or iPod uh, touch. You can get at this by uh, going into iTunes, clicking on the episode, and then uh, selecting get information. You can uh, right click on the, sorry, I should have pointed that out, a right click on the entry for this particular podcast, let's say, um, where let's say you play it in context there. You can right click on it, uh, a little pop-up menu comes up, select uh, get info, and then there's other options, and there's a list that shows a selection of lyrics. And if you click on lyrics, that's where the text will be for the top 10. Now that's the information about getting the top 10 list. Uh, several people wrote in last week as well. And uh, there was more follow-up again on the interview with Catherine. And uh, we also got uh, feedback from uh, Jan and Amy. Uh, Jan wrote, uh, might be interesting to shift the focus subtly from staying sane to enhancing life by cultivating qualities such as forgiveness, compassion, kindness, 
honesty, and love? And how about exploring synchronicity, creativity, integrity, spirituality, and grace? So thanks so much for that, uh, Jan. And we will, or I will actually address those topics in future episodes. So thanks very much for those suggestions. Uh, again, we've gotten a lot of feedback in the past, you know, saying thanks for the podcast series. Haven't got an awful lot uh, of uh, specific suggestions. So thanks so much, Jan, for those suggestions. I'll take those to heart and include those in future episodes. Amy also wrote in, she said, I just found your podcast via iTunes. I'm finding it so helpful to me right now, and I wanted to personally thank you. I look forward to the future episodes. So tell me what, what's worked for you in terms of this two-way communication. What kind of sessions have been most useful to you? What kinds of things may not have worked out very well? You know, that you tried something that I suggested, but it didn't quite uh, work out the way that I had described it. Provide that feedback as well. And of course, also any suggestions for kinds of topics or even format kinds of things you might want to hear in the future as well, because this is your podcast. I'd like to provide the information that I can to you in the form and with the content that you would like. So that's what this is all about. And as I said earlier too, this is all about two-way communication. So also write to me and you can either provide a comment in iTunes itself, or you can provide some feedback by sending me an email at lifehabits at gmail.com. You can also provide feedback, ratings and feedback on the site that has the show notes, which is lifehabits.podbean.com. And you can also follow me on a thing called Twitter. If you go to www.twitter.com slash Carl Vradenberg, you have to first uh, sign up for Twitter, but it's free, and so you can create create yourself an account there. It's this whole new Web 2.0 system for what's called mini-blogging. Uh, you can use your users yourself. You can follow other people. You can also provide information that others can follow you with. And what I often put into that Twitter feed, as it's called, is, you know, some stuff that I'm doing, sort of insights that I've gleaned during a day, as well as some things that I've been reading, other podcasts I've been li listening to, and that sort of thing as well. So that's another way of having more of this two-way communication. You can also contact me on Twitter as well and make suggestions or comments with regard to this show or anything else. So that's it for this particular installment. I'd like to thank you all for listening. This wouldn't be possible without all of you. Please do get back to me too for any of the ideas that I suggested earlier. And best of luck on achieving self-actualization. That's it for this week. Talk to you all next time. Bye for now.